There's Danny Flexen here for seconds out with the latest edition of the Bella's Digest with the man himself, Lou DeBella. Lou, as is customary, how has your week been? My week's fine. I'm actually sitting here listening to Miles Davis having a little Johnny Walker Blue in my office. Um, so I'm, I'm at the moment, my week was fine. I went to Richmond, Virginia. We had our our like annual postseason dinner with all our fans, and I just got back from Richmond today. Um, and uh, preparing for the return of Broadway boxing to Broadway on Tuesday night, November 22nd. But uh, but all is good, man. All is good. I can't complain. It's raining. We're getting the remnants of the uh, whatever hurricane hit Florida. So it's pouring rain here. But, but I, I got I was able to fly from Richmond to uh, to Long Island today. So I'm happy to be home. Oh, great stuff. Tell us a little bit about the return of Broadway boxing then. Yeah, week on Tuesday. You must be you must be delighted. I am. It's the first show back in New York City since December 5th, 2019, since before the pandemic. Um, I mean, we've done Broadway boxings, but we've really taken it on the road. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're doing this at, back on Broadway. It's li literally the return of Broadway boxing to Broadway. It's at the iconic um, Edison Ballroom, which is connected to the Edison Hotel right in the middle of the theater district. I mean, if you're a boxing fan, it's a few blocks walk. You can go to Jimmy's Bar right after the fights, but it's going to be like, this is like our big party. Thanksgiving week's a big party week here. Uh, everyone celebrates Thanksgiving on Thursday, Friday's the day off. It's sort of like people traditionally the Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday night before Thanksgiving, people go out and hang out. So I'm going to do this fight card on Tuesday night. It's going to be like gourmet food, open bar, and uh, and a really good fight card. I mean, major talent. The I mean, there's an undefeated kid, McQuan Williams, in the main event, who's uh, you know soon to be world rated. I think at 140 pounds, and Stefan Shaw, who, who I think might be the best American heavyweight, but certainly right now, if you were making a list, he'd be probably number two to you know in terms of most people's lists to uh, uh, Big Baby Anderson. Um, but I think that Stefan Shaw might be the finest American heavyweight right now. Um, he's on against uh, Rydell Booker and um, Juan Carlos Carrillo, who's a Colombian Olympian undefeated pro that I have, fighting Matthew Tinker from Ireland, uh, moved to New York. Um, and I have a great women's card uh, fight on with Makaya Krebs, who was a U.S. Olympian, fighting on the card. And it's, uh, you know, it's a terrific club show. It's going to be televised on Fight TV. Fight TV is going to have it available by stream around the world. So if people want to see the show, you can be there. But the people there are going to be drinking top shelf booze, eating steaks, and and uh, and uh, having a good time. I mean, I I really wanted I wanted to bring Broadway boxing back at least once in 2022 to New York City. I mean, when I say New York City, I mean Manhattan, and and there really hasn't been club boxing in Manhattan very often uh, recently. Um, there was a show last month. My show's coming, and then hopefully, I think there'll be another show coming in December. And I'm looking to come back with more regularity to New York City next year. Uh, I, I still am looking for the perfect place, but for this type of show, for a dinner theater kind of show, the Edison Ballroom is like literally one of the nicest rooms in all of New York. And it's really like iconic, uh, you know, play, Broadway plays have been hosted there. Press conferences have been hosted there. You know, Celine Dion is sung there with like, I don't know how many other great talents have performed there. Um, it's a it's a it's a beautiful beautiful like marble classic kind of little room and there's going to be under 500 people there so it's going to be like like an old-fashioned smoker with no smoke or at, least, <laughs> or at least none that anyone will be aware of yeah yeah we'll, we'll leave that one there um okay. you mentioned the uh, american heavyweights there we're hosting one later this month in jermaine franklin who's coming over to fight dillian white He's been inactive, Jermaine Franklin, but most people seem to think he's he's a talent at least. What sort of threat can he pose to Dillian White, in your view? None. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm sort of half kidding. It, it depends, and, and and he's not untalented, but he's he's extraordinarily lazy and renowned to be, and always has had a lot of problems with management and other people around him, and is pulled out of fights and has been way out of shape. I mean, the biggest win of his career was a loss. Like, the biggest win of his career 
They, he was given a win on national television against Jerry Forrest mm-hmm. in a fight where every fucking person that watched it watched him get his ass kicked. Like, not only did he not win, it wasn't a close fight. It should have been a pretty wide decision for Jerry Forrest. Um, and he and he won on an utter robbery. And, and, and that's really the credential that's getting him this fight. Mm-hmm. Um, he was scheduled to fight Stefan Shaw. Um, and he, and he, I think multiple times he was scheduled. And one time there was some kind of, he got COVID or he, he was sick or something happened. There was another one we just pulled out. He was supposed to fight on NBC Sports now. I don't know all the details, but a lot of it I heard was that he just simply wasn't in shape. I mean, he has the reputation for being lazy. I'll say this. If you see some ripped version of, of Jermaine Franklin get on the scales and he looks like he's cut out of, uh, of granite, um, then maybe he's taken his career seriously. And, and uh, coming off all this inactivity, having lost to Jerry Forrest with a reputation for not working very hard, um, he's going to have to, to rise in terms of his dedication and preparation to the level of maybe his talent. He's never shown it. He hasn't shown it, right? So does he have the credentials where people should really be sitting here going, oh, here's a huge threat to Dillian White? No, 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 no. But, but could the best version of Jermaine Franklin give Dillian White a fight? Yes, but I haven't seen the best version of him yet, right? So I guess that's better. Like, he's not some no hope, right? Mm-hmm. But keep in mind that Jerry Forrest beat his ass and that he really hasn't fought anybody else and that he's really not reputed to be a particularly hard-working kind of preparation kind of guy. If he has gotten himself into extraordinary shape, Dillian's not getting younger. But Dillian, you know, Dillian's still, I think, a world-class guy and Jermaine's yet to prove that he is. You see, interestingly... Jerry Forrest, that hasn't won a fight in a couple of years, has proven he's a warm class guy. I mean, he ripped the pectoral muscle and he still went the distance and gave Pulev a hell of a fight. Mm-hmm. He, 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 you know, he had the draw with, with Zhang in, in, a, in a tremendous fight, Jalil Zhang. And, and then he had uh, the, the robbery against Michael Hunter. They called it a draw, but Hunter got his ass kicked. Now you're going to see Hunter in a big fight soon, I think on Sky from what I hear mm-hmm. um, at some point. But but Hunter didn't beat Jerry Forrest, and neither did Jermaine Franklin. Um, Hunter, I think, just thought, really thought, underestimated Forrest. Um, and I think, frankly, Jermaine just wasn't as good as Forrest, right? Now, if, if Dillian still has enough left in the tank, I, I don't see it being a very difficult uh, situation, but... If you see some extraordinarily muscular version and some guy that doesn't look like he's got an extra tire and a guy and, and you know if you the best of Jermaine Franklin, I think could be competitive. Okay. But I again I don't know if you're going to get the best. Now something that people certainly on social. By the way, the Broadway boxing has two other heavyweights on it. Undefeated Michael Periton from Belgium. He's six and zero right now. He's a Belgian amateur, very athletic kid. He still has a long way to go. But I think I think he's he's got the body for it and the athleticism, and and, and he's been he's been you know really passed every test I've given him, and then Fernelli Feliz Jr., who I don't promote, he's promoted I think uh, by Greg Cohen, but he's managed by a few friends of mine, and he'll be on the show too. So there'll be three heavyweight fights on the show. Um, Makaya Kreps is the woman who's on the show, but it's a really good show. So November twenty second, any uh, anybody who hears this who's in the New York area. Uh, 212-947-2577 to get tickets. 212-947-2577. That's Lou's uh, exclusive cell number there, people. So <laughs> I hope you wrote that down. Um, Something a lot of people have been talking about on social if media. Anybody, it's not my exclusive cell number. But <laughs> it's, actually my, it's actually my office number. So if anyone's just really mean and wants to torture poor Sean, Sean yeah. they now have to reach him. Good luck with that, Sean. Sean will be watching this, just ripping his hair out. But yeah, it's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, something a lot of people have been talking about on social media recently, boxing-wise, is Terence Crawford and Errol Spence. Not because they're fighting each other, unfortunately, uh, but Crawford has announced his next fight against David Avenesian. And this kind of led to a back and forth with him and Spence and blaming each other. Dude, for I, you know what, dude? I, I, I am tired. I will no longer read any bullshit 
of somebody talking about someone else's fighter, like one promoter talking about other people's fighters. I don't read any of that shit anymore. None of it, zero, right? And I will not read anything coming out of the mouth of any fighter, whether it's on social media or on uh, any kind of boxing platform or journalistic uh, endeavor or, or YouTube show or podcast. I, like why something didn't happen, I'm not listening to that shit. I'm not listening to anyone else's version of it. I'll say this about that situation, okay? It's preposterous that fight's not happening. Fewer people care about it than any, anyone believes. It's our little world, our little sphere of hardcore fans that are dying for that fight, and we can't even give them that. Um, it's sort of disgraceful. Now, that being said, I don't hate anybody involved. And if Crawford's getting 10 fucking million dollars to fight David fucking Abanesian. Look, David Abanesian is actually a tough guy. Like, I like him. I'm sort of a fan. But you got to match David Abanesian right. Like, you make the Aben David Abanesian against a lot of guys that are sort of more brawling kind of guys, you know, not pound for pound fucking guys, not athletic, like top of the top 10 pound for pound level boxers, not scientists. They're going to play with him. I mean, the, the, the preposterousness of the fight is someone's going to give Crawford $10 million to fucking fight a fucking fight that if he doesn't break his leg during the fight or have some health kind of related problem unrelated to his opponent, that he has no chance of winning. No chance of winning. So if, if, if Crawford's getting 10 mil for fighting David, and I'm, again, I like David, but that's... That fight's a terrible matchup for David Abenez. Terrible. I mean, if you want to pick a fight that's just sort of like something that that Crawford can get off his fucking couch and win, it's David Abenez. It's the style. His styles make fights. I mean, David's not good enough to ever beat Bud, but his style's such that he's not a puncher. He's like a volume guy. He just comes right at you. He throws punches. He's... He's a warrior, right? But like the other guy's a fucking like top of the pound for pound list scientist. The other guy can do everything. Take your head off, outbox you. Like, and I mean, David, David's going to be lost in that fight. So if the 10 million, if, if he really got half his money already, and I don't know that to be a fact, but I'm reading it places. But if he got half his money already, already gotten $5 million, he hasn't even gotten the ring yet. And the other 5 million is going to come on December 11th. God bless him. He made a good business deal. You know? And Errol, it's not Errol Spence's fault. Not Errol Spence's fault, I don't think, from what I hear. I mean, the fight didn't happen. I mean, I, I don't know. If the fighters wanted it bad enough and insisted upon it, and we're, look, I guess Crawford also figures if I'm getting $10 million for David Abedizian, I got to get a hell of a lot more like that than that guaranteed to fight, you know, whatever. But he's making a business decision. He's getting $10 million to fight Abedizian. I'm not going to pay for it. I'm not paying for it. Okay? That's just my personal decision. Now, by the way, I, I'm a huge fan of Buds. Uh, but if, like, you know, if you're a big fan of Buds and you want to see him perform, it's going to be like dancing with the stars. There's going to be one star and the other person is who they are. And the star is going to win. Well, here, the star is going to win. Um, but if you want to see it, God bless you. Right? But if he's getting $10 million from his own perspective, that's a lot of money for no risk, right? And with respect to Errol, I'm a big fan of Errol. So if, if Errol fights Keith Thurman, I, I'll watch. You know, if Errol, you know, if you give Errol a real, real fight, Stanio, I mean, even Stanios is a real fighter. You know, I'll watch. I mean, uh, it's not what anyone wants. And I think everyone has a right to be pissed off. But let's face the reality, man. This is the norm. This isn't the exception. Not getting what we want to see is the norm. Convincing ourselves that mediocrity is worth paying for is the norm, right? And I don't give a fuck if people think I'm salty. I'm done with that, man. Like, I'm not going to make believe. Like, I don't care, too. I'm pretty consistent. Say what you will. I'm pretty consistent, right? You know? And then I got morons telling me when I say something about a, a, a non-value $80 pay-per-view, people calling me saying, well, your new campuses wasn't going to beat Haney. No, I knew that a guy that was one fight away from being undisputed got his rematch. And guess what? If, other than in, in Australia, where Cambosis is still a, a former undisputed champion, one fight removed, Haney had just fought there, and we were delivering a big event with the Maloney brothers, 
Trinika Johnson, another women's female world champion, a loaded, serious card, whatever. It was still in the United States. It was on ESPN, right? So I'm pretty consistent, and and I fit, and and look, I'm doing Broadway boxing. It's like if you go to Fight TV, it's twenty bucks. I think that you go to you would pay for two people to watch the movie twenty bucks. If you're home and you're going to order a premiere of a movie, for it's twenty bucks. So it's twenty bucks on Fight TV to join me where I'm going to be in that arena, join us and watch a really good fight card with a lot of talent. I mean, this is a real Tim Boxeo special, but it, but on the highest level, not on a low level, not the stuff that Tim watches every night. Um, but for night, you know, for twenty bucks US, you you know, you're gonna watch it. Okay, it's your choice. If if you know, it's also your choice to to buy for eighty bucks or not buy for eighty bucks. But personally, when you start getting into eighty bucks, and I know who's gonna win the main event, and I'm not particularly scintillated by the undercard. I'm not giving anybody my money. How, for people that aren't aware of kind of the TV side of things, how is this new player in the market, how can they afford to pay Crawford $10 million for what most people consider a formality? Anybody with a lot of money can afford to lose money. What's the end game? Is it to make an impression in the market? Well, I mean, there are such things as lost leaders. They have some kind of a site. It's you know, BLK Prime or Black Prime or whatever. I mean, it's not my, it's not a site that I'm regular. I'm not their audience. But but if they believe this is the lost leader, I mean, it's certainly a great fighter. I mean, it's an all-time great fighter. Say what you will. I mean, and, and, they're, and they're going to Omaha, where in Omaha they will own the city. It will be a huge event. It will, I believe it will sell out. And if, look, if they, you know, but that's a lot of money to lose. And that, I, you know, there's no way in the world they're going to recoup $10 million to Crawford or whatever they're giving Avenesian and all their other expenses. I hope they do. I don't give a shit who they are. I hope they do. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm serious. Like, you come in the money, you throw around a lot of money. It's better for the business if you're actually able to get your money out. But do I think they're going to get their money out? No. Is Trill, I mean, did Triller get their money out? No. Is The Zone getting their money out? No. I don't Tell me who the fuck is getting their money out. I mean, I think ESPN... Is, is is and to some extent Showtime as a franchise, as long as there is Showtime boxing on Showtime premium, you know, cable service. You know, they have a franchise there. They're getting value there. They're, they're, there's a subscription service showing it. Um, Fox, I, 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 you know, I, I think that, that boxing for a network getting live programming is inexpensive live sports programming. But but the the businesses that are looking for a trend, box on a transactional basis to be the basis of their businesses, mo I mean, I guess it's a lost leader. It, the, the zone will, is losing money until they can get enough penetration worldwide to make money. And it's not the only sport in their portfolio. And they're starting to do uh, influencer stuff and trying to expand the the portfolio of their combat sports. You know, and it's, I guess it's a lost leader in a lot of places. There's also a lot of just stupid, crazy money that comes in. And they come in and they don't last very long. And and there are a lot of flashes in the pan. But this has been, it's been this way forever. Because like I've often said to you, my friend, in many editions of the Bella Digest, <laughs> it's the Dodge City of sports, man. It's no barriers to entry. No. Any fucking moron could get into boxing. Anybody can get out of <laughs> Anybody can be a manager and anybody can be a promoter and anybody can be a journalist. Anybody with a fucking <laughs> cell phone can be a broadcaster, right? And and today in 2022 boxing, anybody that has, has enough followers on some fucking social media service is a boxer. So, I mean, there are no barriers to So, you know, hey. And on that note, <laughs> as the Johnny Walker Blue goes down, uh, Lou, really appreciate your time. I'm going to let you enjoy the rest of your night. Bit of Miles Davis. I have a question for you. What, what fight for the remainder of the year, without thinking about it, you're most interested in? Uh, for me, Josh Kelly against Troy Williamson. Kind of domestic, you know, fight, but world level. You know what, you know, I gotta say, say, thank you for saying that. I'm glad I asked that question. Because I don't give a flying fuck about that fight. No. Honestly, the domestic 
great fight. I just don't know either guy very well. But I've seen both fight, and that's actually a really good matchup. Yeah. And if I can get if I can get a stream of that here, if I wasn't like that's the kind of thing on an afternoon if I'm not watching a football game or while watching a football game, I'll watch. So remind me about that one. Um, you know what's funny? I, I think I'm, the, I'm I'm most interested in. Well, first of all, I have Jalalov, mm. November 26th, Thanksgiving weekend, Saturday. I have Jalalov and Conwell on the Regis Progre, Zapata or Zapata Progre, whoever you want to put first, pay-per-view show. Um, uh, yeah, they're charging for that, but I want to tell you something. That one, I, I see, I think that's what I would buy. I will buy. I'm going to buy because my staff's going and I'm not going. I have to go to a, mm. a family party that night, but I will be buying it. And I'll be buying it because you get Jalalov, who I think is going to be heavyweight champion someday in the undercard. You get Conwell against uh, uh, Abreu in a good fight. Want to call this Abreu in a good fight between two ranked guys. Um, And you get to see Conwell, who I think is going to be world champion. Um, There's a great women's uh, title unification match on there. And the main event, here's the key. Two of the top five 40-pounders in the world, without question, probably two of the Two of the top five is fair to say. Probably two of the top three, actually. But right up there. And, well, two of the top five, let me be fair. Two of the top five 140-pounders, without question, fighting each other in a meaningful fight. And the outcome's totally in doubt. It's a betting fight. See, to me, that's fun to watch. And, you know, Thanksgiving weekend, after getting stuck Thanksgiving night, watching some football or being at family events, Turn on a, a pay per view and you watch some good fights. I, I to me, that's so that, that's pay per viewable, right? I, I'm not into these pay per views where I don't have a doubt about who's going to win or the ones that stick in my craw, right? Like the, those are the ones that just bother me, you know. And by the way, if if you like you like a particular fighter, you're a Terrence Crawford fan, support Terrence Crawford, and you you, you know he's so good. By the way, I enjoy watching him in a mismatch fight. Because he's that fucking good, right? But it's up to you whether you want to buy it. But for the good of the sport, for fan appreciate, you know, for fans to appreciate us, for us to attract new fans to grow our sport, it's got to be the biggest names fighting the biggest names and biggest fucking fights. And, and that's what the best business is: the biggest fucking fights, the biggest names, and the best fights fighting each other, right? And everything underneath it that's televised on a paper fit transaction basis, whether it's streaming or pay-per-view, should be basically be competitive fights. Mm. That is what Dana White does best. That's what his people in Nevada on that UFC compound do best. They make competitive matches. And that's why their sport is growing quicker among young people than ours is. Because it's more entertaining. Just on that note, did you um, see Anthony Joshua off the cuff mentioning he'd quite like to fight Jalalov? Um, I love that. Let's yeah, I'm sure, yeah. No, and I, you know what, too? He's not, if he really wanted to do it, now would be the time for Anthony to do it. I, I mean, I'm not going to bullshit you. As great an amateur as Jalalov has been, I mean, Jack Malawai, so far, is really the best guy sport as a pro. And and uh, he's fighting Curtis Harper, who is, is a, actually a good opponent if he doesn't freak out before the bell. Um, but but it's, it's very hard to match Jalalov because no one wants to fight that monster. And that's the truth. I mean, they want ungodly sums of money or they won't do it. And But right now, Jalalov hasn't fought. I mean, I mean, come on. I mean, Anthony's one of the best heavyweights in the world. And he's fought the best heavyweights in the world. Not hasn't fought Usyk, hasn't Usyk, hasn't fought... Uh, uh, Wilder. I mean, I actually sorry, fought Usyk twice. Lost twice to Usyk. Hasn't fought Wilder. Hasn't fought Fury. Right, but he, he's unquestionably one of the best heavyweights in the world. For her, and he has been for a while. And and right now, Chalalov's green. But I mean, I don't. I wouldn't be asking for Chalalov. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Chalalov, like just on physical freakiness, Chalalov could walk in a ring and beat Joshua on a particular night. Now, that's a great fight right now because. Jalalov's, you know, a little green, and Joshua's, like, still, you know, late prime, that'd be a great fight. I'd love to see that at some point. But, I mean, like, I think it's pretty wild that Joshua mentioned it. But, you know, Joshua's aware of Jalalov. They've, he's seen him before. And I think, interestingly, other heavyweights, like, I know Fury 
thinks very highly of, of Jalal. If he's told me that, um, you know, a lot of heavyweights that have seen Jalal have, are impressed because it's not only is he a physical specimen, he's a fucking monster. And, 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 and the punching power is, you know, is insane. Ask, you know, Torres, you know, who's a good fighter, you know, now with top rank, Re interesting kid, by the way. I like that kid a lot. I'm a fan, but I mean, Jalal have hit him with a punch that was like getting hit with a, 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 a lightning strike. I mean, it was insane. And, and it, and he just, he was out, you know, and, and Jalal has that kind of concussive power. But what's really unusual about Jalalov is the mobility, the the fleet. Like he's got that movement and that that speed that Fury has. You know, he has that like you know, he moves more like Usyk than he does like the Klitschkos. You know what I'm saying? And 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 he's his talent is freaky. Are there vulnerabilities? You know, he's been buzzed, never been knocked down, but he's been buzzed. Um, he he is he still has somewhat to learn. I mean he I, he needs a little bit more progression, right? But not much more. I think it's one more year, and I think in one more year he becomes the worst nightmare of everybody. I think he's a year away of being the scariest man in the division. I really believe that. I mean, um, this is not promoter hype. I mean, I, it really, I really mean that, you know. And I also really mean that. Steve, watch Stephen Shaw on November twenty second. Either on Fight TV or come to the fights. I think a great, great, great all U.S. fight that I think you 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 really could see in 2023 in the heavyweight division would be the battle to determine who is the best um, American heavyweight between uh, Anderson and and Stefan Shaw. I think that's a huge potential fight. Now Stefan Shaw, uh, it, you know, has it has Guido Vianello potentially in January. He's got Rydell Booker. The twenty second, he's got to win those two fights. But later next year, Shaw and and, and Anderson will be a great, great matchup of two up and coming, you know, American heavyweights. Um, so I'm look. I mean, I'm looking forward to to that. Jerry Forrest is fighting Anderson at the Garden underneath Teofimo Lopez in December, and you know Jerry is one of those few real professional heavyweight opponents that's scary any given night. Like Jerry can will fight you and he will take you to hell any given night. Now you, you, you may beat him, you may get a draw with him, but you're going to fight and he may beat you. And if he, and he, by the way, if you're a fraud or you're lazy, he's going to, he's going to uncover you. So, you know, that's a, like, that's a real test for Anderson in December. But if Anderson passes that test and, and, and the two tests in front of Shaw, he passes, that's the fight I think you could see to establish the real next guy in America, the successor to, Wilder and Ruiz and, and, and those guys. Brilliant stuff. Lou, really, really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm sure you will. And um, I'll see you hopefully next week. I look forward to it. Thank you, Danny. Cheers, Lou. Take care.